Hello, I'm uh, John Banton from Diver Magazine. I'm the technical editor, and my job is to go diving and write about it. But of course, there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, I have to travel around, I have to go diving and evaluate equipment, I have to evaluate dive sites, I have to write about marine life, and I have to write about the sort of people who go diving. Well, I started diving as a hobby uh, back in 1979. And uh, I used to work in the advertising business, which took me around the world to various exotic locations. And often there was an opportunity to spend a couple of days diving while I was there. So uh, I got quite keen on diving. And then uh, during the late 80s, I decided to do a couple of diving videos because, uh, believe it or not, there weren't any diving videos available in those days. And I was well placed to do that at the time because I was shooting television commercials for the British market. And um, I started doing these videos and then I somehow got a relationship with Diver Magazine and I started contributing articles to them and one thing led to another and by 1992 I was more or less working for them full time. Well because it's much more attainable now. Uh, it used to be that for example if you wanted to go to the Red Sea uh, you camped on the shore, you slept on a, on a rock in a sleeping bag and it was a hardship posting. You know, after a week you might come home and uh, have a wash. That was something of a luxury. Today, of course, you go down there to Egypt and it's uh, being like any other international country that uh, has all the facilities that you need and it's very, very comfortable. Well, I've been sent to do all sorts of things. I've done, I've done uh, diving profiles of people like Chris Boardman, the uh, Olympic cyclist, and uh, James Crossley, Hunter the Gladiator. Uh, I've done... Uh, uh, character studies of various uh, well-known names in the diving field. I've been, uh, I've been with uh, Nigel Marvin doing a feature on him in the Galapagos uh, when he was doing a feature for Shark Week uh, at Discovery Channel. Um, I've, um, I do everything really to do with diving and of course while I'm going diving I'm always using diving equipment and I tend to be using diving equipment that I haven't used before and then I get to know during a week or so of diving, and then I'm well placed to write a review of that as well. So I do the tests of equipment on the back of other trips. I've been on trips that have gone badly wrong, and of course that can make a good story because people love to hear a disaster story. Uh, I had a, a, a really unfortunate event once when a girl got bitten in the face by a conger eel, and um, Discovery Channel made a film about it later and in fact actually making the film was a lot more dangerous than the original uh, event. This is a typical thing that happens. Um, when I worked in the film business I was known for the guy that did the reshoot first and uh, in a, fu son a funny sort of way I'm uh, still firefighting. Uh, last night they came to me and they said they hadn't got a presenter to do anything with this uh, particular booth and what do I do a presentation on Egypt? Well, of course, I've been to Egypt thousands of times. I've got a library of pictures um, on my hard drives in my office of, of probably half a million pictures. Uh, probably 200,000 of those are of Egypt. But of course, I'm standing here in Birmingham, so I actually had to contrive something that I just happened to have on my computer. So uh, that was really not a good example. That was an example of me uh, firefighting rather than going in as a prepared professional. Well, in 1992, I decided to take a year off from the business I was in to go diving. And I got a job as a dive guide in the, on a boat in the Red Sea. Uh, in those days, uh, uh, there were foreigners operating in the Red Sea, and I was on an English boat, a British boat, I should say. And uh, I worked for six months as a dive guide and realized that that was not a career I wanted to uh, continue with. Very, very hard work, very tough hardship posting on a liverboard with no, uh, no backup of any sort. Uh, I then tried uh, running a dive centre of my own in, in the Mediterranean, which worked very well, but the season wasn't long enough to make any money. And inevitably, I got drawn back to what I knew, which was the media. And so, uh, Diver Magazine had a, a dominant position in the uh, market in those days. And um, so, it was inevitable that I would go and work for them. It isn't glamorous when you have to get up early in the morning to get in a taxi to go to the airport. It isn't glamour when you're queuing to get through security. It's not glamorous when you're fighting with, uh, um, emotionally fighting with the check-in staff to get uh, 100 kilos of baggage checked in when you've got a 20 kilogram allowance. But uh, when you get there, of course, it always comes right. And people ask me sometimes, which is the best place I've been diving? I say, 
the next place. Anywhere can be the best place on the day. It depends what's going on. And uh, for example, uh, diving over some Posidonia seagrass can be very, very boring. But if you've got a dugong grazing on it, it becomes very exciting. I don't think there really is a job. There's a shortage of jobs as a diving journalist. People often write to me and they say, how can I become a diving journalist? And I have to explain to them that I have a, a spectrum of other skills, which are, the, which are the skills that got me the job. It's almost as if the, uh, the writing was something they could sort out later. I actually write for Diver magazine, but I also write for Duk in Denmark and Duk in Sweden. Well, uh, they, they translate my words into Swedish and Danish and uh, do a very good job of it, I'm sure. Not that I can tell. And I think sometimes that they translate my words into English and Diver magazine too. But uh, the important thing is that I come back with the pictures and the basic story. One of the great icons of diving, Stan Waterman, is a hero of mine and a personal friend. And he's 85. He's got 24 years on me and he's still doing it. So I said to Stan, you know, when you pop your clogs, Stan, can I be you? I'm going to carry on doing it until no one wants me to do it anymore. That's a nice sentiment. Thank you very much for talking to us, John. My pleasure. Thank you.